Good morning from the United States. Uh, I've been asked by Mr. Soup if I'd be willing to do a quick video of something of historical importance here for where I live here in the Midwest in the United States. Uh, as soon as he asked me, I knew what I wanted to cover. So we're going to briefly go over the uh, Missouri Kansas border war, uh, also known as Bleeding Kansas. It was a uh, basically faction scuffle back and forth across the Missouri Kansas border pre Civil War, about 1856, well through the Civil War. Um, it's a history that I I really passionate about. Um, a lot of historians don't really look at what happened over into the West. Uh, when you think of the Civil War, uh, the American Civil War, they think of Antietam. Uh, Gettysburg, Bull Run, Vicksburg, all these big grand battles, um, but they don't really seem to have a whole lot of emphasis on what's going on or what happened in the West. And that's what I wanted to kind of cover, uh, make you guys all aware of, uh, of uh, some of the very important vital events that had happened that even led up to the Civil War. And most people think of the Civil War, they think the Civil War started um, at Fort Sumter, uh, in Charleston Bay on April 12th, uh, 1861. Um, but in reality, and a lot of historians now are starting to look more toward the West, it really started happening before then. Um, basically, before, uh, let's see, 1854, before 1854, there was the Missouri Compromise, which basically in the, in the United States, it was based on longitude whether your state was a free state or if it was a slave state, and they used the longitude based on that. Well, there was a Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 that basically changed all that and said if we're instead of using the longitude, what we're going to use is we're going to let the residents of the territory that's going to become a state decide if they want to be uh, pro-slavery or if they want to be a free state. Now, because of this new act that came into law and that created factions, you had people from not the state, not even citizens in that area, coming across into Kansas uh, that were pro-slave or anti-slave and forming these factions that were trying to make the state whatever they thought was the best for them. Um, and that eventually boiled over and it got to a point where they, the fighting broke out. So it was very much pre-Civil War, but historians today are starting to see it as that was really when it started happening. Um, and there hasn't been a whole lot of study on it, Luckily, that has been changing, though. So an overview, very, very broad overview because of the time restraints that we have. Um, if people wish to have more videos, I can definitely do that. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of rich history here that really gets you sucked in once you start studying it. Um, but the two factions that we were talking about. Uh, the two factions that when most people look at the border wars are the Missouri Bushwhackers. That was the guerrillas, the pro-Confederate, uh, pro-slavery uh, guerrillas, renegades. Um, these were not regular soldiers like Confederate soldiers or Union soldiers. Uh, these were uh, these were civilians who just basically formed a mob and did well. They did a lot of raiding, a lot of plundering, a lot of murdering uh, across the border uh, into the other state. The other side was Kansas Jayhawkers. Those were Union cavalry at first, uh, but as time progressed and they started getting more and more vicious about. Uh, how they did things, their tactics. Um, pretty soon the Union um, government started kind of distancing themselves from what the Jayhawkers were doing, um, which was pretty much the exact same thing that the Missouri guerrillas were doing. So um, when you look at the history here in the United States, you can also see the development or you'll basically you'll see famous people uh, people of note i guess wouldn't say famous because some of them were infamous but you see people of note so like on the bushwhacker side you had william quantrell bloody bill anderson those were the bushwhacker um like the captains the leaders uh, that did a lot of the leading through the guerrilla warfare through um missouri and kansas but a lot of people don't know them they will know however frank and jesse james who became outlaws in the midwest after the war along with their friends uh bob and cole younger uh, who are outlaws as well. On the Jayhawker side, you don't know a whole lot about them. Uh, you got James Lane, Charles Jennison, and James Montgomery, uh, who were in charge of those cavalry units that were running through uh, as Jayhawkers. Uh, a lot of people don't know about them as much. When you look at the history around here, Jayhawkers are actually kind of celebrated um, as uh, heroes, even though in reality they weren't. They were just as bad as the Bushwhackers were. Um, uh, abolitionist John Brown, 
Uh, they have him at the Kansas Historical uh, Museum out here, a state museum. Um, and he's kind of enshrined as a, a, a hero, an abolitionist uh, who freed slaves, but at the same time, he was just as ruthless and murderous as, uh, as the Jayhawkers were. Um, now, when you think of uh, some examples of some of these battles of how bad they were, unfortunately, because of the documentation that's out there right now, um, the first-hand, second-hand accounts, um, you would think some of them are not as bad as others, but at least that's how it looks. Um, but in reality, it doesn't matter the numbers. Both sides were, were in the wrong of how they dealt with um, the situation out here. So, like, as far as the Jayhawkers go on the Union side, on the on the on the uh, uh, free slavery, you know, free free slaves um, against uh, Missouri. Those were Union soldiers, or at least they looked like it. They had the blue uniform on with red leggings. That's what recognized them as Jayhawkers. They did a raid on Osceola, Missouri. Now Osceola, Missouri is uh, farther into uh, Missouri. Um, but it was raided. Uh, basically, James Lane let the cavalry in there. They rounded up nine civilians who, regardless of the evidence, they thought they were pro-Confederate sympathizers. So they did a very quick makeshift trial, found them guilty of uh, being traitors to the United States, and was executed right there on the spot. Now, that wasn't enough, apparently, so the Jayhawkers decided to have a party afterwards where they all got drunk and they pretty much burned down the entire town, uh, liberating the slaves, and at the same time, though, looting anything of value. Basically, there was nothing but a shell of a town when it left, uh, when they left. Uh, and that town has never never really recovered. At the time, Osceola was a very prominent, bustling town, and today it's just kind of a small little town in the middle of the country out here in Missouri. So, um, now that kind of raid basically caused a domino effect where the bushwhackers on the other side wanted vengeance, wanted to get vengeance or payback for what the, the Jayhawkers have done who came from Kansas. So the most prominent, I think, um, event of the border war that most historians know about is the Massacre of Lawrence. Well, Massacre of Lawrence, depending on where you're from. If you're from Missouri, Battle of Lawrence. Well, at least that's what a lot of people I talk to call it. On the Kansas side, Massacre of Lawrence. But no matter what, it was a massacre, no matter how you wanted to look at it. Um, Quantrill's men, uh, William Quantrill, one of the captains of the Bushwhackers, one of the leaders out there, rode into Lawrence with about 400 men. And the standing order was, if they're old enough to carry a gun, they need to be dealt with. So about 182 men were dragged from their homes and in front of their family were executed in cold blood for uh, suspected of being part of the problem with uh, the Jayhawkers out there. And then they rode back into Missouri. Um, matter of fact, because of all this, Kansas is actually was the highest rate of fatal uh, casualties of any Union state uh, be right before and during the Civil War. Uh, that was largely because of the great internal uh, divisions on the issue of slavery. Um, hence the reason they call it Bleeding Kansas. But yes, number one, and, that, and that's not including soldiers, that's just the overall fatality. So very bloody, very vicious, uh, total war kind of atmosphere over here in uh, Missouri, Kansas. Now, as far as what the archaeology has been done today, uh, there's not a whole lot, to be honest with you. It's very disappointing. Um, the, right now, luckily, uh, there is a Dr. Ann Robb. Uh, she is from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She also works with uh, Kansas University, and she has been doing archaeology down in Bates County. Uh, with the General Order Number 11, and I can go into that more when it's on another day, um, but uh, it was an attempt to quell the pro-Confederate guerrillas in the area to try to stop the raiding into Kansas. Uh, and she's been doing a lot of archaeology there. Um, what's the, the final thing that I find interesting about this is after 150 plus years, this Kansas-Missouri border war still goes on today. Now, of course, it's not as drastic as it has been in the past, but we have it in sports. We have people from Kansas, Missouri, bashing on each other, regardless of you know how they're acting, how they're driving. There's just all kinds of of still that little bit of tension from way back when. Um, so it's still evident today of seeing that kind of Missouri, Kansas uh, tension between each other. Uh, matter of fact, there is even some places that still celebrate that massacre in Lawrence, in Missouri. Um, so it's it's kind of a shocker, um, but at the same time, it's not really surprising me having grown up here all my life. Um, so um, 
that's it. That's that's it in a very brief, brief, broad uh, nutshell. Uh, so down below here, whoop, whoop, over here, over here. Down below there, I put some links, uh, some good, uh, a good lecture done by some professors or some scholars who did it on uh, the Border Wars. Um, some book ideas or some book recommendations, things like that, if you're interested in more. And if you're interested in more videos, uh, I'd be more than happy to give them to you. So uh, thanks for taking time and listening to me uh, talk about this a little bit. And I hope you all have a great rest of the week, and I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.